was there something you were supposed to pick up? Do you want to see me about something? Well, I can wait a little <laughs> Wait a minute. It's getting sort of late. Does your mother know where you are? I asked if I could come over. Well, what are we waiting for? Come on. What's on your mind, son? Come on, sit down. Tell me all about it. They made fun of me, Mr. Frickson. Mm -hmm. They never did that before. Who do you mean by they, Bobby? Some of the kids at school. Any particular reason? Well, yeah, I was arguing with them. What was the argument about? Getting by with things. Oh, what kind of things? Cheating mostly, but there were other things too, like telling lies and stealing stuff. And, and they thought they could get by with those things? They said they were getting by with them. Oh, I see. And you know what else, Mr. Fixit? What else, son? They really laughed at me when I told them that God knew what they were doing. And unless times have changed, they probably went on to say, so what if God does know? God never does anything about anything. That's exactly what they said, Mr. Fixit. How did you know? Well, that's an interesting story. Would you like to hear it? You mean you got a story for that, too? <laughs> yes, Bobby. The Bible's got a story for just about anything. You know, son, there are lots of people in the world today that are laughing at God, that think they can get by with doing anything they want to do. But you see these people here? They had that very same idea. We read about these people in the first book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis. Right or wrong didn't make any difference to these people. They did what they wanted to do. And gradually the world became a place where the people lived as though there were no God. And there wasn't any such thing as decency or respect. Might was right. And the people even killed each other and thought nothing of it. And when God looked down on this bloodshed and wickedness, he knew that before long, man would destroy not only his own body, but his soul. Was everybody like that, Mr. Fixit? Well, just about everybody. In all the world, Bobby, there was only one man and his family that were living the way God wanted them to. And that man's name was Noah. Noah believed in God, and he was thankful for whatever God gave him. Noah taught his family to believe in God, too. And the faith of these few people caused them to find favor in the sight of the Lord. One day, God told Noah to go and tell the sinful people of the world that unless they recognized God's claim upon them and lived differently, they were going to be punished. And Noah did as God had told him to do. Noah pleaded with them to get down on their knees and to ask God for forgiveness. But uh, do you think they did, Bobby? No, they didn't want anybody telling them what to do, not even God. And you know, it must have been pretty discouraging to Noah to have the people react the way they did. But if those people thought they were going to get the best of Noah, they had another thing coming. God had given Noah a job to do, and Noah knew that if God was with him, no man could stand against him. So Noah kept right on preaching even though the people of the world did make fun of him. But one day, God told Noah he was going to destroy the earth. Every living thing was to perish except Noah, his family, and a certain number of the animals that were living upon the earth. A huge boat was to be built, and God had told Noah exactly how to build it. And since Noah and his sons believed in God, they lost no time in doing what they had been told to do. Now, the building of the ark was no secret, son, and the framework of the huge vessel attracted a lot of attention, and the people began to be curious. What was this crazy old man up to this time? And when Noah told them there was a flood coming that would destroy every living thing on the face of the earth except those that were in the ark, the unbelieving people were certain the old man had lost his mind. And there was nothing Noah could say that made any difference. The people just refused to listen, and they went on back to their sinful ways of living. Well, the day finally came when the ark was completed. 
And then Noah set about doing the other things that God had told him to do. The pairs of all the different kinds of animals were taken into the ark. And food and other supplies were taken aboard, enough to last for a long, long time. And when all of this was done, Noah, his sons and their families all went into the ark, and we read in the seventh chapter of Genesis that the Lord shut them in. You know, there comes a time, Bobby, when God quits waiting on man to make up his mind, and man has only himself to blame when the door slams shut in his face. That very same thing is going to happen again one of these days. We read about it in the Bible. Only a lot of folks in this day and age aren't any more concerned than they were back then. Even if there was a God, what could God do to hurt them? Well, the days went by. One. Two, three, four. And all this time, Noah and the members of his family simply waited on the Lord. Five days went by, then six, and still nothing happened. But on that seventh day... that Noah had warned the people of for a hundred and twenty years came to pass. The Bible says that the windows of heaven were open. Mountains of the great deep were broken up. And the people knew not until the flood came and took them away. Boy, what a storm! Yes, Bobby, the wrath of God is a terrible thing. Whatever prompts man to think he can get by with what God has told him not to do is more than I can understand. When God says that he's going to do something, son, he does it, like with the flood. When it finally stopped raining, the water was 22 and a half feet above the top of the highest mountain, and the people and the animals outside the ark perished. Week after week went by, even months, and the water remained on the earth. And then one day, God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters began to go down. And the big ark came to rest high among the mountains of Ararat. And Noah sent forth a raven and a dove. And because the dove returned to the ark, Noah knew that the waters were not yet gone. The next time he released the dove, she returned with an olive twig in her mouth, and then Noah knew that the time would soon be when he and his family could leave the ark and live once more upon the earth. And sure enough, shortly after that, God told Noah to take his family and all the living things that were in the ark and live again upon the earth. And Noah and his family were thankful to God for saving them. And God was pleased with their thanksgiving and set a rainbow in the clouds as a promise that he would never again destroy man by a flood. Is that right, Mr. Fixit? That's right, Bobby. You mean nothing like that will ever happen again? Well, there'll never be another flood to destroy all the living things on earth. But there is another judgment coming, son. And the people who haven't done what God's told them to do are going to perish. What's God told them to do, Mr. Fixit? Now, you know the answer to that. You know John 3:16, don't you? For God so loved the world mm -hmm. that he gave, gave his only begotten, begotten son, son, that whosoever believeth in him it does say that, Mr. Fixit. Say what, Bobby? Shall not perish. That's right. Now, do you know the rest of it? But have everlasting life. It's a wonderful promise, isn't it? And you know that promise was made to everybody on the face of the earth. That word whosoever means you, me, anybody who will believe in him. What if a person doesn't know about Jesus? Well, we haven't done our jobs right then. We know about him. We ought to tell him. What if they won't listen? Well, they didn't listen to Noah. What did he do? 
Well, you gonna go back and argue with them some more? Just gonna make sure they know. I think we can go home now, son. so frightened you're gonna have me thinking I'm the meanest man in town. There, that's more like it. We're old friends, remember, Freddy? Now let me ask you something. Did you break that window? Oh, uh, I was playing at the time. But you weren't the only one. No. Where'd the other fellas go? I don't know, but some of them are gonna be sore at me for coming in. Sore? Didn't you come in to get the ball? Not especially. Why did you come in, Freddy? Come on now, you can tell me. We're sorry we broke your window, Mr. Fixit. We'll pay for you as soon as we can. Son, you don't know how good that makes me feel. Your being sorry is worth a lot more than the price of that window. Come on, sit down, son. You know, it took a lot of courage for you to come in here and say a thing like that. Mr. And Fixit, I. Freddy didn't do it. Didn't do what, Pete? He didn't break the window. I did. You mean you hit the ball? Yes, sir. How many other fellows were playing, Pete? Oh, eight or ten, I guess. They waiting for you? Not that I know of. Well, come on in. Grab yourself a box or a chair or a stool or something there and come on over and sit down. Doesn't seem quite right. I uh, know the whole team was playing, but it looks like you two fellows have got to take the blame. We're in on it too, Mr. Fixit. Can we come in? I was hoping you would, fellas. Come on in. You boys look like you've really been playing ball. Wouldn't you like to rest a little bit? Why don't you sit down right where you are? Well, I feel better about this now. Got the whole ball team taking the blame. It's not an easy thing to do what you're doing, fellas, but it's the right thing, and that's what counts. You know, you boys remind me of a story. Would you tell it to us, Mr. Fixit? Well, that's up to the ball team. Would you like to take time out long enough to hear it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, talk me into it. This is a story about a man that had courage concerning a window, just like you fellas have. Would you know who it is? It's about a man named Daniel. And at the time of the story, Daniel was a very wise old man. And here in this picture, we see Daniel being honored before the king. Now, King Darius was very fond of Daniel. He greatly depended on the old man to help him govern the kingdom. At this particular time, the Media Persian Empire reached from Media and Persia 
way over to Egypt and the Mediterranean Sea. And King Darius had chosen 120 princes to help him rule over this vast empire. Now over these princes he placed three presidents, and the first of these was Daniel. Because Daniel was a very likable person, and because he was far wiser than anyone else in the kingdom, Daniel was the favorite of the king. And because of this, the other princes hated him. Jealousy made them bitter, and they reasoned in their hearts that some way, somehow, they must get rid of Daniel, so that one of them could be put in his position. Now, Daniel may have known how the princes felt about him, that they would spy on him and try to find something wrong with what he was doing, but Daniel lived in such a way that he had nothing to fear from man. Daniel made sure that everything he did was pleasing in the sight of God, and he knew in his heart that God would never fail him. And when a man lives like that, fellas, it's pretty hard to find anything wrong with his personal life. Spying on Daniel was proving to be a waste of time. The princes all agreed that in order to rob this man of his position and authority, they would have to resort to foul play. So that's what they decided to do. They thought of a plan that would trick Daniel into disobeying the king. The princes gathered together outside the palace and waited for permission to speak to their mighty monarch. Now King Darius was somewhat surprised by this request. Ordinarily, the rulers of the provinces were called together by royal decree only. But still the king was curious to know what the princes wanted. So he granted them permission to come before him. And the one who had been chosen to speak for the group stepped forward. And he said to the king with great respect, King Darius, live forever. And then he went on to tell the king that all the presidents of the kingdom and the governors and the princes and the captains had all consulted one another and they had decided that a new law should be made to honor the king. That no man throughout the entire kingdom was to ask anyone, God or man, for anything for 30 days unless it be asked of the king. And if anyone broke that law, that person would be thrown into the den of lions. Well, this was flattering to King Darius. It didn't even occur to the king that Daniel had been left out of the planning. So the king signed the decree and made it law. Now, fellas, in those days, when the king signed something, it was final. Not even the king himself could undo what he had done. How many of you know what that did to Daniel? Did that mean you couldn't ask God for anything? That's right. That's what the law said. Nobody could ask anything of anybody, God or man, for 30 days. And when Daniel heard about the law, he knew in his heart that this was a trap that had been set for him. You see, three times every day, Daniel prayed before his open window. This was something he had done for a long, long time. Now, Daniel could have closed that window, and it took real courage to keep from doing that very thing. But Daniel knew that to close that window would be cowardly, and he also knew that regardless of what other men would try to do to him, God's will in his life would be done. So. Daniel continued to pray before the open window, just as he had done before. And of course, that's what the princes were waiting for. They lost no time in running to the king and demanding the death of this man who had broken the law. Daniel had been praying to his God three times each day and asking for strength and wisdom, just as he had done in the past. Well, the king was miserable when he realized what had happened. The king was very fond of Daniel. He relied greatly on the judgment of this wise old man, and he certainly didn't want to see him die. Darius spent the whole day searching through the laws, trying to find some way that he could save his friend. But fellows, there wasn't any way. And with the setting of the sun, the ruler had to command that Daniel be taken to the place where the lions were kept. 
To be thrown to the lions was known to be a horrible death. The animals were crazy with hunger. Whatever was thrown to them was instantly torn into pieces. The king told Daniel how sorry he was and how that surely God would save Daniel since Daniel had been so faithful to him. And then Daniel was thrown through the hole in the ground down into the den of the lions. And a great stone was brought and placed over the hole. And the seal of the king was placed upon it so that no one would dare to remove the stone. And the king returned to the palace with a very heavy heart. Do lions eat Daniel, Mr. Fixer? That's what the king was wondering. He couldn't eat for thinking about it. And he didn't want to see anybody either. He rolled and he tossed in his bed all night long, wondering what had happened to his friend. And when the light of the morning sun told King Darius that the night was over, the king hurriedly dressed himself and ran to the place of the lion's den and had the stone rolled away. And then the king shouted down into the den, Daniel! Daniel, is thy God able to deliver thee from the lions? And as King Darius listened, this is what he heard. O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lions' mouths that they have not hurt me. The king was happy to hear the voice of his friend, and he commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den at once. And he further commanded that the men who had plotted this evil deed be thrown to the lions in Daniel's place. And then the good king signed another law. This law decreed that in every dominion of his kingdom, men were to tremble and fear before the God of Israel. For the God of Israel was the living God, and steadfast forever. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. What about those other men? You mean the ones that took Daniel's place? Well, those men didn't care anything about God. Right or wrong didn't make any difference to them, so they got what they justly deserved. Listen, fellas, no matter what you're doing, whether it's playing baseball or anything else, if you'll make this your rule book and him your umpire, you don't have anything to be afraid of. What about your window, Mr. Fixit? Still thinking about that, huh, Pete? Well, sure. We broke it. That's right, you did. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I've got a piece of glass that size, but it did cost me a little something. So if you fellows will make a delivery for me, I'll call it square, okay? But that won't take all this, will it, Mr. Fixit? Well, it'll involve each one of you as much as anything I can think of. Is it ready now? Yes, I think it's ready now. Here it is, Freddy. See if this gets back where it came from, will you? Yes, sir. Thanks, Mr. Fixit. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, let's play ball, boys, huh? <laughs> 